older gentleman had uh, had a doctor's appointment. And after he had his checkup and everything, the doctor said, well, is there anything else I can help you with? He said, well, doc, he said, not me so much, but I think my wife is losing her hearing. And she's so stubborn, I don't think I can get her to the doctor. She won't believe me if I just say she's losing her hearing. He says, okay, well, this is what you got to do. What you got to do is you have to say something about 10 feet away from her. And if she doesn't hear you, then take a step closer. Say it again. And if she doesn't hear you, take another step. Say it again. And if she doesn't hear you, take another step and say it again. And if she ever hears you, you have a point. You can say, well, I said the same thing over here with the same voice, and you didn't hear me. And maybe we can get her to go see the doctor to get her hearing checked. He said, oh, that's a good idea, doctor. So he goes home. He walks in the door. His wife is at the stove, and she's fixing something for dinner. And he says, oh, I'm going to give this a try right now. So he says, honey, what are you making? She doesn't say anything. So he takes a step closer to her and he says, honey, what are you making? She doesn't say anything. He takes a step closer to her. He says, honey, what are you making? <clears throat> Nothing. He takes a step closer and says, honey, what are you making? And she says, for the fifth time, I am making meatloaf and green, be green beans for supper. <laughs> Hearing is an important thing, isn't it? We're going to get into a lot of trouble if we can't hear. A lot of times we, we can pinpoint when other people aren't listening or people are not, are not listening something very important, but oftentimes it's hard to find that same problem within ourselves. But we are Christians. We are Christians that all appreciate the simple fact that our faith, our faith is built on hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And each of us, each of us needs to make it an imperative in our life to make sure that we don't have a hearing problem, that we have our minds and our hearts open to what the Word of God is going to say to us. But we might find ourselves looking like a fool when it's all said and done. The topic that we are going to discuss this morning is something that many people do not take the time to hear what the Word of God has to say. We're going to be looking at the phrase, call upon the name of the Lord. It's a biblical phrase, and it's a phrase that people use and throw around, but unfortunately it is a phrase that people do not appreciate to its full extent of what it means. And because of that, there are a lot of people who Jesus speaks about in Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 21. Who are going to say, on that day, Lord, didn't we do all these wonderful deeds? And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. Jesus says, not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. But he who does the will of my Father. Yeah. Jesus said, not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. I have underneath that Acts chapter 2 and verse number 21, where Peter, speaking of the prophecy of Joel, says, And all who do call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, if we went into any church building this morning, there would be a lot of people that would be contradicting Jesus by the things that Peter said in Acts chapter 2. And what I mean by that is they would take that phrase, calling upon the name of the Lord, and they would use it in such a way that it totally neglect, negates what the Lord said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. 
Turn it into something that is strictly an audible and an emotional response to the invitation of Christ. This morning, I want us to hear what the Word of God has to say on this most important topic. The Bible, as you know, was revealed and it spans three different dispensations of time. There was the patriarchal dispensation or age where God spoke through the fathers on an individual basis. Then there was the Mosaic period that was delivered to Moses on Sinai. And that was in effect for about 1,500 years until the day of Pentecost when Christ as king raised into heaven sitting on the right hand of God allowed Peter and the rest of the apostles to preach his new message the gospel message. Well, through the Bible, though, we have themes that show up in each one of these ages. And while the theme is present, the specifics of that theme or the specifics of that topic may change as we go. I'll give you a good example to introduce the lesson this morning. That is the idea of sin. We first get our a glimpse of sin in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve eat of the forbidden fruit, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But the first time the word sin is used is actually in Genesis chapter 4 after Cain kills Abel, or before Cain kills Abel. When Cain had offered a sacrifice that wasn't pleasing to God, and God tells him, If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Now he's talking about a sin, something specific, but we are going to learn something about what sin is through this Old Testament passage. We're going to learn that sin is, is a destructive force, that when we get into the cycle of sin, we're going to go on a downward slope into more and more sin. We learn something about sin and its nature by going back to the Old Testament. We might not know the exact specific sin, or we might not be able to commit the exact specific sin. If we go back to the original sin in Genesis chapter 3, I can't commit that sin. I can't eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil because that tree is not available for me today. I can't commit that specific sin. There were sins that were revealed or, or laws that were given in the book and the law of Moses in which I cannot commit today. I can't transgress the, the Sabbath laws. I can't transgress the, the laws concerning animals that were clean or unclean. I don't have that ability because Jesus was the Lord of the Sabbath and he nailed that old law to the cross and also we know from from the, uh, the book of Acts, that all those meats and those, those animals were made clean. So I can't commit those specific sins, but when I go and study, I get a good idea of, well, what is sin? Maybe not specifically, but I do know that sin is a transgression of what God has said. The New Testament reveals it in pretty much those same exact words in 1 John chapter 3. In verse number four, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness. Or as the King James puts it, sin is transgression of the law of God. So I can go to the Old Testament and I could learn about things. I could learn about themes in the New Testament. I want to know more about sin. I could go to the Old Testament and have a better understanding and clearer illustrations of what sin is. What I want to do this morning is I want to go back to the Old Testament to help us understand what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. This isn't something that just shows up on the scene in the book of Acts or in the book of Joel. This is something that goes back almost as far as the garden. So if you have your Bibles this morning, turn them to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 4. Let's 
So we're going to fast forward past when Cain uh, kills Abel. And it's, it says in uh, verse number 16 that Cain, after he killed Abel, he went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Now, if we skip down to verse number 25, it says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth, for God has anointed or appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. And then here's our phrase. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. That's the first time we are going to find that phrase, call upon the name of the Lord. And it's interesting of what we can learn by looking just at the immediate context and what is going on at this time to better understand, maybe not specifically, what we need to do to call upon the name of the Lord, but what this phrase has meant, this underlying teaching that's associated with this phrase, call upon the name of the Lord. The first thing I want to point out is back in Genesis chapter 4 and verse number 1. It says, Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired, from, acquired a man from the Lord, or from Jehovah. Now, what that tells me, what I learned from just reading that verse, is that calling upon the name of the Lord wasn't that God revealed his name to the people, and they knew God on a first name basis. Because back when Cain was born, remember this is after Cain has already left, but back when Cain was born, Eve prayed to God and said God's name, Jehovah. So I learned something immediately from this. Calling upon the name of the Lord, while it may mean something associated with his name, it does not simply mean I call upon the name of the Lord because this didn't happen until probably hundreds of years after that event. What I also learned from this verse is some, some idea of the significance of the phrase. Now, when you go back up to chapter 4 and verse number 16, it says, Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And it might be good for you to underline that phrase or make a note in your Bible of Cain went out of the presence of of the Lord. That is significant. Because what's going to happen is the next verses are going to speak about the civilization that's established by Cain's lineage. Uh, verse number 17 Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch, or his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad begot Mehujael, and Mehujael begot Methuselah, and Methusael begot Lamech, and Lamech took for himself two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the name of the second was Zillah. And Ada bore Jabal. Now it says, He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the harp and flute. And as for Zillah, she, was, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain was Naaman. Now, I want to understand what's going on here. Cain has left the presence of the Lord. He goes from the presence of the Lord and starts to establish his family starts to establish his lineage and starts to establish various civilizations. Now, what was this civilization founded on? Well, it wasn't found on being with God. It wasn't founded on 
an understanding of the presence of God. This civilization was a godless society. It had become completely worldly, detached from God. And so we have these, these various trades uh, built. We have those who dwell in tents and have livestock. We have harp and flute. We have culture being invented. We have every instructor. The trades are introduced into the world. And all of these are built not on God, but on man. Built on man. And that's important to our understanding of the significance of the phrase calling upon the name of the Lord. There was already, there was already this glimpse of what is going to happen when you go down this worldly road. In verse number uh, 23, one of Cain's wives, or one of Cain's sons, or descendants of Cain, said to one of his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventyfold. <laughs> This is, this is what happens when you go down a worldly way. You're going to get into sin. You thought the sin of Cain was bad? Well, let me tell you, I didn't even have a reason to kill this person. I just killed him out of my own hatred and vengeance. And if Cain's punishment was going to be that, I can self-judge myself and know that my sin was worth it. Here's the point. When people walk away from God, society is going to get more and more and more and more sinful. What about us? What about us who want to be distinguished from that? Be distinct from that? What do we do? What do we do? I, I contend that that is what this phrase originally meant when it's revealed here. In Genesis chapter 4, calling upon the name of the Lord in its most generic terms was a way for me, if I was back in those times, to say, no, 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 I'm not one of these people. I follow God. I want his presence. I don't want to leave the presence of God. I want to be within his presence. I want to follow what he has revealed. I want to do what God says. I want to be one of God's children. Not a child of Cain. And if you look over in chapter 6, in verse number 1, it says, Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, daughters were born to them. And it says in verse 2, The sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Now, notice that phrase, sons of God. Some people like to get all mystical and mythical and say, well, this is a reference to angels interbreeding with, with, uh, with humans. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about these people who in chapter 4, verse number 26, who called upon the name of the Lord, lived faithful for a while until even the temptations of the world corrupted even the sons of God, those who would call upon the name of the Lord. And as that chapter unfolds, we find out that God's plan is then to destroy the world because of its wickedness. But I have a good I have a good starting point on understanding this phrase, call upon the name of the Lord. It's a desire to distinguish myself from the world, to be separate from them. I don't want to be known as someone of the world. I want to be known as someone of God. I want God to be my father. I want to follow God. Now, if we turn our Bibles over to Genesis chapter 12, we're going to get a little bit more of an understanding of this phrase. In 
Genesis chapter 12, Abram receives the call of God in, in verse number one. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will uh, that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord God had spoken to him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land of the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Morah, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your descendants, I will give this land. Now, this is where it gets important to pay attention. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar of the Lord and called on the name of of the Lord. Now, we need a little bit of understanding of some specifics of calling on the name of the Lord. There does seem to be some sort of worshipful or, or spiritual aspect to this beyond obviously just speaking out and saying, Lord, I want to, I want to be one of your children. There's something that goes along with it. And the name of the Lord is Jehovah, which is his covenant name. And that's exactly what Abram and the Lord did on this occasion. God made a promise to Abram. I'm going to give you this land. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. You are going to inherit this property. That's an oath. That's a covenant relationship that I'm entering into with you. And what does Abram do on his side? Well, he builds an altar to the Lord. And he accepts those terms of the covenant. So we don't need to sit here and say, well, we need to go and build altars all over the place. That's not the point. We don't go back here and understand the specifics of what we need to do to call upon the name of the Lord. But we better understand it. The calling upon the name of the Lord is entering into a covenant relationship with God where he has offered a promise. And we have responded in some way. With some sign of, the, of our joint relationship. If we go over in Genesis chapter 13. And starting in verse number 1. Some things have transpired. Abram went, uh, went down to Egypt. So now he's coming back up from Egypt. He and his wife and all that he had. And Lot with him to the south. Abram was very rich in livestock. In silver and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. Now listen, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. This wasn't just something he, he did, he moved on, he never thought of it again. He had an altar. He had something that he could point to and say, yes, that is it. Remember? Remember? I called upon the name of the Lord here. I have a covenant with God here. I can go back. I can remember that I did my part in the oath that God made to me. Now, is that what we need to do? No. No, we don't call upon the name of the Lord in this way. But those underlying threads are right there. In our expectation, we call upon the name of the Lord. There's a lot of people this morning who think that the more they say Jesus in a sermon, the more righteous they are. They'll say well, every other syllable. They'll say, they'll say Jesus or they'll say Lord or something along those lines. And it comes from thinking that that's what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. But it doesn't. It never does. It never meant just strictly saying, Lord, I'm following you. 
It was a serious promise with serious implications that was always involving a complete lifestyle change, a complete separation from the world. Now let's turn our Bibles to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, that is. This is that day of Pentecost. The Lord's church was established. His kingdom on earth was built. It's built on a promise that God had made in Joel chapter 2. And that's exactly what Peter begins his sermon on on that day. He's speaking in tongues. The, the 11 are speaking in tongues as well. The crowd has no clue what is going on. How are these people able to speak in these languages that they never learned? And Peter says in verse number 16, This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my men's, men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. This is, these are the events that are going to happen to signify this promise of the Lord. And here's the promise, verse number 21, that it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And what does that mean to us? Well, that means whoever goes into this relationship with God, whoever wants to be distinct from the world, whoever wants to have a covenant that, that can stand on the promises that God has made, that's what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. So how do we do that? That's the important question. I don't think that there's anyone in town who would deny that you have to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. It would deny the importance of it, or any of the things that we've really studied this morning. But the specifics of what it means, how do I call upon the name of the Lord, is up for so much debate and discussion and opinion. But luckily, God has given us his word that's going to lay it out perfectly for us. Peter begins his sermon by saying this is a fulfillment of the promise of God. In other words, it's now the time that Joel spoke about. This is, this is where we're at, that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Starting today, starting right now, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He goes on to preach the gospel of Jesus and his death and his burial and his resurrection and how God has, has ordained him as king, anointed him as king of kings, and Lord of Lords, and when these people hear it and they find out that they are the ones who are in fact responsible for, for killing the Christ, they say, brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? We know the response of Peter. Repent, therefore, and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children and to all those who are afar off. And what I want to do this morning is I want to appreciate a few things. If you've been marking in your Bible, I want you to underline that verse, chapter 2 and verse number 21. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then what I want you to do I want you to underline chapter 37, specifically, men and brethren, what shall we do?
And then I want you to go down to verse number 39, and I want you to underline the phrase, for the promise. In some way that's easy for you to identify, I want you to circle all of those phrases and link them together. The whole purpose of this sermon that Peter is going to give is to allow people to understand how one calls upon the name of the Lord. How is one going to be saved? That's the whole purpose of this. And we understand from those, those first verses, it's got to be built on the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's got to be built on a belief that Jesus was who he says that he was. But we immediately have to realize that that isn't it. They were at that point in verse number uh, 37 when they responded back. What do we need to do? There was something more. This may be a crude illustration. But what I want to point out this morning as a visual aid to help you understand what we are talking about. As we are going to build a calling upon the name of the Lord sandwich this morning. Because that's precisely what we have in Acts chapter 2. We have on the top button, verse number 36. Uh, or I'm sorry, uh, verse number 37. What shall we do in reference to calling upon the name of the Lord? In verse number 39. We have a reference to the promise. And so what we have in between these two verses are some items that we need to put on our calling upon the name of the Lord sandwich. It says, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit. We need to realize that calling upon the name of the Lord involves a repentance. And we go back to that original understanding back in Genesis. Wasn't, wasn't there a change? Wasn't there a different course of life that these people wanted to associ associate themselves with? They wanted to walk in the path of God. That's what, that's what calling upon the name of the Lord is as far as repentance goes. I don't want to go down this road. I don't want to continue down this path. I want to follow after God's way. Repent and be baptized. Now, we're building a sandwich. And what we want to do is we want to find the sum total of God's word regarding a specific topic. We don't want to pick and choose one verse and leave out other verses. So let's turn to Romans chapter 10 and appreciate what the Apostle Paul says about calling upon the name of the Lord. speaking here concerning his brethren, the Jewish people and his desire for them to be able to be saved. And the way in which they are going to be saved is, is going to be the same way that we're saved, by the gospel of Jesus Christ. But they need to hear the gospel. It needs to be preached to them. But Paul says in verse uh, number 8, what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one confesses unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. Now listen to this in verse 13. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now it goes back to that same promise that Joel made. That same promise that Peter preached about. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what do we want to do? Do we want to remove Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 from our sandwich? We want to remove something that God has placed 
in between these, these two pieces of bread? Or do we just want to add what else has been revealed in Scripture? If we're going to be respectful to the Word of God, we're going to be respectful for how God wants us to interpret His Word, we have no right removing these things. If repentance and baptism are, are part of calling upon the name of the Lord, I have no right to remove it. And if confession and belief are part of calling upon the name of the Lord, I have no obligation or I have no right to remove it. Instead, I can add it to my calling upon the name of the Lord sandwich and get a better understanding and a better picture of what God means by that phrase. Now, finally, let's turn to Acts chapter 22 and verse uh, number 16. Here's a wonderful example of someone who did call upon the name of the Lord. In order to appreciate this text even more, we need to have a better understanding of who Paul was. Paul was there when Stephen was being put to death for preaching uh, against those rebellious Jewish people. It says that Paul was there and they were laying the coats, laying their coats at his feet. And Paul was consenting to their death. Paul hated Christians. Now, do you think that Paul hated Christians without ever understanding what they were about? That he hated them without knowing what they taught? Now, obviously, he didn't understand it. He didn't have an appreciation for it. But he was there when Stephen was preaching the gospel. He was there when Stephen spoke of seeing the Lord and asking Jesus to forgive, forgive those people. He was there. But he didn't believe it. And so as Paul was making his way to Damascus one day, Jesus appeared to him on that road. And spoke to him and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard to kick against the goats. You're going to be a chosen vessel of mine to go and preach to the Gentiles. But he wasn't saved. He had this personal experience with Jesus. He heard the gospel. He heard Stephen preach the gospel. He didn't believe it. But now he has this face-to-face -face interaction with Jesus. He's not saved. Now, I don't care how emotional I can get, but my emotions are never going to, to trump what happened to Paul. He had an emotional experience that was also extremely real. But he was not. He was, he was not saved. Paul prayed for three days. He prayed for three days. Who was he praying to? What was he praying for? He prayed for three days. He had an emotional experience. He believed the gospel. He wasn't saved. Why not? Because there was something that he had to do in order to be saved. He still had to call upon the name of the Lord. Even though he said, Lord, who are you on the way to Damascus? And even though he'd been praying to the Lord for three days, even though all of these things were going on, he had still not called upon the name of the Lord in its totality as it's revealed in Scripture. And so what is he told? In Acts chapter 22 and verse number 16. It says, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. Amen. You're not saved until you call upon the name of the Lord. And you're not calling upon the name of the Lord until you actually call upon the name of the Lord as God has told us to do it. He's made it perfectly clear of what we need to do. In order to be saved. And the reason he's made it clear is because he wants every single one of us to be saved. I want to go through a list of things that, that calling upon the name of the Lord, what it means to us. 
what it should mean to us as Christians. All of us who have obeyed the gospel. These should be things that we can look back on and appreciate. We can, we can analyze whether it's true for us or whether it's not or if it's something that's valuable or not. But these are some things that are associated with salvation. In John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, Jesus talks about how we must be born again. We must be born of the water and the spirit. And that's a, that's a very abbreviated uh, teaching on obeying the gospel, of calling upon the name of the Lord. But what's associated with it is being born again. I get to be something new. I get to be born into the family of God. I get to be one of God's children. Along those same lines, I get to put to death my old self. All that sin, all that guilt that weighs on my shoulders, I can put it all to death. I bury it in the watery grave. It's a plea to enter into Christ. Where all of those spiritual blessings are, redemption, grace, the blood of Christ, adoption, that entire list of Ephesians chapter 1, it's all there. And when I call upon the name of the Lord, I am pleading with God to let me in. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 21. Peter says, Baptism does now also save you, not to putting away of filth and flesh, but an appeal to God for a clean conscience. Do you remember that? Do you remember when you made that appeal to God? What a weight. What a weight sin has. Like what, what God told Cain. It's crouching at the door. It, you just can't get away from it. Because sin leaves us with guilt. Guilt that we can never, ever shake on our own. But God says, if you call upon my name, you can appeal to me. You can appeal to me to remove every bit of that weight that hangs on your shoulders. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 13. It says, You have all been baptized into one body. It allows us to be a part of the church. Calling upon the name of the Lord is a request to God to let me be a part of your special people who are distinguished from the world, who are distinct, who live a different way, who live holy lives, who are acceptable to you. I want to be a part of that. Could you imagine it? God says, if, if you call upon me, you can. All of us, every single one of us in this room, if we just call upon the name of the Lord, we can have every one of those things and more. We can get the best end of the deal. If you look back on that day, when you think about today, are you distinct from the world? Have you gone to the sons of men, the sons of women? You were once a child of God. You were a son of God. And you were attracted by the flesh. Are you distinct? This morning there may be someone who needs to obey the gospel. May be that you need to call upon the name of the Lord that first time and appeal to God to be a new creature, to be a Christian. But there may be someone here this morning who has sinned publicly and has not lived up to the name that God has given. This morning you have the opportunity to repent, confess that, and, and be added again uh, into that wonderful grace of God. If there's any need, come forward.